Okay. So welcome everyone to this Team WSF Dish with Pepper. My name is Pepper Persley. Um, I'm excited to be working with WSF to share the stories of some amazing female athletes um, competing in the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Joining me today is um, Amy Dixon. Hi, Amy. How are you doing? Good morning. Thanks for having me, Pepper. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm super excited to, to be chatting with you today. All right. So what does it mean to you to be a Paralympian? Wow, it's, it's a real honor um, to be able to represent my country in a way that I never imagined, especially as an older female athlete. Um, certainly, I thought this was out of the cards for me, but I'm just very excited and honored to represent the United States. Yeah, I can't imagine what it means like in the pride to be able to wear USA um, across your chest and to be able to represent um, your country. Um, so um, how did you know, how did your training change during the pandemic and what does your training look like getting ready for the Paralympics? Good question. So uh, because I am a visually impaired or blind athlete, um, I need a guide in order to run safely uh, out on the roads and on the track. And so during the pandemic, all the tracks shut down in San Diego and uh, most of California and the gyms all shut down. And so a company, a local company that's involved with the YMCA where I train was kind enough to donate a commercial treadmill for me to use in my garage. So I've been training on that uh, because, you know, because of social distancing, I wasn't able to run with guides. And um, so that was a way to keep me safe and keep my training going during the pandemic and pools shut down as well. And again, through the kindness of a, a really nice lady that trains at the YMCA, she offered her backyard pool, which was only 18 yards. It's a little short for us, about like seven yards short, but it was better than nothing. And we also luckily have the ocean out here in San Diego, but it's a little chilly in the winter. And uh, so, yeah, I was able to continue uh, training in the backyard pool and also in the ocean. Uh, and then I built a gym in my garage. Um, so I was able to lift weights and strength train there. And then I did video, uh, Zoom, Zoom video sessions with my strength coach. And finally, uh, for the bike, because I'm a triathlete, um, my bike is hooked up indoors to a stationary trainer and it sends all the data, the electronic information to my coach virtually. And so... Yeah, so I was able to swim, bike, and run just in kind of a different way. All right. So you mentioned, you know, um, having a pool to use um, that maybe was a little bit shorter, but also using the ocean. So were there any differences you noticed between the two? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, actually, I just got done swimming in the ocean with my guide this morning. And, you know, you definitely have more wildlife, a lot of waves and temperature differences in the ocean. Where we're going to be swimming in Tokyo, the water is quite warm. It's actually kind of hot. Um, so trying to get acclimated to that by wearing a very thick wetsuit to make sure that we're kind of toasty warm, swimming in pools that are a little bit warmer than we're comfortable with to kind of get acclimated to those, those warmer water temperatures. Uh, and yeah, you, your stroke definitely changes from the ocean to the pool, um, uh, depending on how choppy it is. But, I, you know, I do enjoy having the benefit of having the ocean right here. And most of my races are in the ocean as well. Yeah. So, you know, you train um, in three different ways, obviously running, swimming um, and on the bike. Um, so do you know, do you have to train triple times or how do you balance um, tra training for all three of the sports? Um, I have a really good coach uh, and he writes the game plan for each week and we touch base on a daily uh, uh, on a daily basis, a couple sometimes a couple times a day uh, and he'll prescribe um however many hours per week I'm going to be running, biking, and swimming, and lifting weights. Um, and I would say pretty much I run every other day, and I bike every other day, um, and then I lift weights twice a week. Um, and then swimming, um, when my shoulder is healthy, I've had some, some shoulder issues this year and had surgery. Um, normally, I'm, I'm swimming six days a week. Wow. So, you know, all three parts of the triathlon are so different. What are your strategies um, for each section of the event? Uh, the swim is about being strong, but conservative, um, you know, trying to take advantage of the fact that we've got some other swimmers in front of us to give us a little bit of a wake to swim off of, a, a little bit of drafting opportunity to save our energy. Um, and then the bike is super fun. I really enjoy the bike portion of the triathlon. Um, the strategy there is, again, like, go as hard as comfortable and, but keeping it in check so that I can run well, because you can't go too hard on the bike. Um, but you know, I have a really good pilot and it's about making sure you're cornering well and saving time, you know, seconds here, seconds there by 
taking good lines and and um and really taking advantage of the course and and cutting some of the turns and things like that really helps us um and also me staying super low in the back to make sure that i can keep the bike as balanced as possible for her to make her job easier and to stay as aerodynamic as possible and then finally on the run it's about making sure that i'm really really smart um that first mile should almost feel a little bit too easy and then the second mile should be very hard and the third mile should feel like you want to pass out <laughs> and you're just praying for that finish line. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of the game plan for Tokyo. All right. Um, so how did you get um, involved in paratriathlons? Well, um, I have an autoimmune disease that took my eyesight when I was 22 is when it's, when I was diagnosed and I was driving up until about age 32. So for another 10 years beyond that, as my disease progressed. And the treatment for my disease is high doses of steroids and chemotherapy to suppress the immune response that's attacking my eyes. And I gained a lot of weight. I gained 75 pounds from all of the medications. And I was a former swimmer from the time I was, I was on swim team from the time I was six years old and all through high school. And someone suggested that I get back in the pool. So, but ironically, I was a breaststroker and a backstroker. I didn't really do freestyle. So and uh, all of triathlon swimming is freestyle swimming. Uh, so I got back in the pool and really enjoyed it and started to get a little bit more fitness. And then I started riding a stationary bike um, and then eventually running on a treadmill. And someone through social media said, well, you're swimming and you're biking and you're running. Have you considered doing a triathlon? I know you're doing it basically indoors at this point. So this woman offered to guide me to race with me and be my eyes for the race. And we raced on a tandem bike. And we raced tethered at my waist uh, during the swim and the run. And I had so much fun. I was immediately hooked. And here we are uh, eight years later and I'm heading to Tokyo. It's pretty cool. Wow, that is really an incredible journey. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so can you talk about um, Camp No Sight, No Limits, um, the first ever camp for blind triathletes um, in the USA? Yeah, so one of uh, the things I discovered the more I got involved in my sport was that there were no coaches that specialized in working with athletes with vision impairments and also with hearing loss. And not that I'm an expert in coaching, but I am an expert blind person. <laughs> so I figured I had some wisdom to impart. And so I decided to put together a camp uh, down at the uh, former Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista here in San Diego. And um, First camp, I think we had 13 blind athletes and 13 guides. And so we borrowed a bunch of tandem bikes. And well, one of the things that uh, I knew was that there were a lot of really good beginner camps around the country, Dare to Try in Chicago, Challenge Athlete Foundation does a really nice job of introducing athletes to the sport, but there was no next level of once they had done a triathlon, how to get faster while being blind and how to really take advantage of of the skill set uh, that you could learn, whether it was tethering techniques, whether it was communication while biking with your guide, um, how to do a transition really fast, even if you can't see, uh, all these things I, I felt that I could teach people. So it was really, really fun. And I started that uh, five years ago. And since then, we've had, uh, I think, 41 athletes come to the camp, and uh, to, one of which is now my teammate, and he's going to Tokyo. I'm so proud. He, he graduated from my camp. Um, so yeah, so it's been really, really exciting and a lot of athletes that have gone on to do Ironman and other, other kinds of races. So, yeah. All right. That's really cool. And I love, um, what you're doing and that camp and how you're making that kind of change. Um, so what kind of impact do you hope your camp can have on the athletes in it? I hope that it makes them realize that just because they are visually impaired, that they don't have to just be a participant in, in triathlon, that they can actually be competitive. Uh, that they actually can beat some people that have full vision or, you know, two good legs, two good eyes, two good arms, uh, that they are, are really capable of doing something at a high level just because they, they can't see doesn't mean that they can't be fast and train really hard. Um, so that's what I'm hoping that a lot of the athletes get out of it and that they get a lot of confidence. That's incredible. Um, I honestly, right now, I'm so inspired by what you're doing. And I'm so glad you were able to share this with us and everybody watching or listening. Um, so what advice do you have for the next generation of um, Paralympic athletes? Uh, I'm really excited to see what the future holds. Uh, doors are opening all over the place for uh, adaptive sports around the country. I'm seeing new, new uh, and exciting clubs pop up. Um, 
more local races that are making their courses friendly for wheelchair athletes, for our athletes with amputations and blind athletes and saying, hey, we welcome you to our race. We're excited to have you here. It's a more of an inclusive environment. Uh, I'm excited because I've got a lot of people that have been contacting me that want to learn about guiding a blind athlete. They say, hey, I've accomplished all my athletic goals for myself. Like I raced an Ironman. I, I did a, you know, I've done Olympic distance triathlon and I want to give back to the sport. How can I volunteer either at your camp or learn how to guide a blind athlete? So I think the future is really bright for the next generation because a lot of people want to get involved in para sports. All right. Um, so last question for you. Um, you know, what, what does the WSF Third Women's Sports Foundation mean to you and what does the work that it's doing mean to you? It's really empowering to, to get the support uh, that WSF has given us on, on the road to Tokyo and also in the road, on the road to Rio as well. Um, I've been involved with WSF and just so exciting to see just amazing female mentors. I mean, like you've got like Billie Jean King and you've got, you know, Alana there, you know, on the board and just these just fast, incredible, talented, ferocious women that are paving the way for the rest of us and teaching us that, you, again, you can be really exceptional in your sport and that it also carries over to the rest of your life after sport, that you can have a, a good career for yourself if, if that involves sport, if that, doesn't, you know, that's outside of sport how it translates and teaching us the way to, to get that done and teaching the next generation that, you know, sports teaches leadership and camaraderie and, and teamwork. And I think that those are skills that are so great to take into your professional career, whatever that is after sport is over for you. Yeah. Um, I think what you just touched on is it's incredibly important. And I think that I feel so lucky to be able to work with the Women's Sports Foundation to highlight the stories of people like you, because they're often um, women's stories, um, sadly, the stories that don't get told enough. So um, I'm so honored to be able to do these interviews with the Women's Sports Foundation and to be um, to be able to talk with you. That is all I have for you um, today, Amy. This was so much fun. Um, I am so looking forward to watching you um, in the Paralympics. Um, and it's been an honor to highlight your story. Um, be safe and good luck. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited for you. Thank you so much, Pepper. I really appreciate you having me. Everybody can tune in to the Olympic channel on Friday, August 27th to watch my race. It'll be at 5.30 Eastern time, 2.30 Pacific. Uh, again, that's on the Olympic channel. And uh, we hope to make you proud over there in Tokyo. Thanks, all WSF, right. for all your support. I'm so glad it's not at like midnight so I can yeah, me watch too. live. <laughs> That's so exciting. All right. Thank you so much. And good, good luck.